Hello. Welcome to the Behavior Panel. Today we're going to be looking at the best of the Royals. And uh, everybody's got their favorite one. And I think, uh, well, Greg, why don't you go first on this? And what's your favorite one? Yeah, a Andrew has to be everybody's favorite. He's like a little circus. When you just, when you think he can stop giving, he brings up a new one. And he just comes up with some zany little thing for you to see. The rest of the royal family had to be rolling their eyes. And then somebody said, hold on a minute. Hold my beer. Chase, who do you think? Yeah, I agree. I've, I've got Andrew too. I was fascinated by the fact that it's kind of like when you're a kid, everything that's inside of the glass of a snow globe is really special. And then, you know, you smash one open on purpose just to get like a little figurine out of it. And it's just like a cheap piece of plastic. And you're like, huh, it's just like every other toy. And I think that's what we've seen with a lot of these Royals. It's like once they come out of the snow globe, we start to realize they're just a human, just like everybody else. Mark? Good analogy. Yeah. Yeah, uh, listen, I wish I could be different. I wish I could be special, but uh, it's, it's got to be Andrew. Uh, sorry, Megan. Sorry, Harry. I know you both like to be special and, and, and very different, uh, but but really Andrew is is the, the, the most exciting one there. It's, it, it's a car crash. It's one of those car crashes where everybody slows down to take a look and they know they shouldn't. Uh, it's horrible to look at, but you cannot look away anywhere else. It's, it's just uh, awful. Uh, Scott, what's your favourite? I, I like Andrew as well, because we see all the hallmarks of someone who's being deceptive and hardcore, writ large, we see those, as I'm sure we'll talk about as we go through this, so no need to go over them. But they're, they're just wonderful examples and things you can pay attention to and start looking for when you're talking to people or watching people on TV to see if they're being deceptive or not. So that was my favorite one. All right, let's get to it. If you're going to marry a royal, then you would do research about what that would mean. Well, I didn't do any research about what that would mean. You didn't do any research? No. I'd never looked up my husband online. I just didn't feel a need to because everything that I needed to know, he was sharing with me, right? Or everything okay. that we thought I needed to know, he was telling me. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so I'm going to start this one off by talking about culture. Culture, no such thing as body language without culture, and it impacts every thing we do. If you think about little kids in the U.S. used to use the same salute the Nazis used to do a, the Pledge of Allegiance until Hitler created that whole mess, and then that went away. That same thing's true about every culture we enter, and so we'll have subcultures. That means the four of us are subculture, a very small culture that creates our own normals and that kind of thing. Then you get to microcultures, and those are things like just a couple of people, and they'll have their own nuanced way of communicating. It's going to come up in this show. But as importantly, that's a step down. That's that micro. And then there are these cloistered cultures that you never get to see. We're going to be talking about one of those cloistered cultures you never get to see. And they have very, very nuanced signaling that you will not pick up on. Just for one minute, think about what it means to bring an American, not, not a person of, not of noble birth, noble birth, British kind of term, Mark, I'm sure you'll talk about, but an American an American into this who's never learned that there's that the queen is not a person, it's an office, all that kind of thing. So we're going to see a lot of that come up in here. But this is an American we're watching. So it gets real easy to think about what some of her body language is. She starts with kind of a curt smirk lip. And then when she says that I did not look this guy up, none of us believe that. I mean, none of us. Chase, if you're going to date the prince tomorrow, I'm sure you'd look him up too, right? That's just the way it goes. All of us would be that way. Then if you look at her condemning there, she reaches for her back. If she weren't pregnant, we would all jump on that and say, okay, that's an adapter. That's a move for her to make herself comfortable. But because she is pregnant, probably related to that. We'll give her the benefit of a doubt there. She does, however, correct herself. And she corrects herself as she adds a comment, well, everything we thought we needed to know. Scott, what do you got? All right. I, I see a bunch of stuff in this. I'm getting a whole bunch. And we do, and Greg, Phil, remember, we do a thing in body language tactics, talks exactly about everything we're seeing here, from groupings of cues we're looking at to uh, her delivery, all this stuff. Now, first thing we see is called the latency. In, in other words, latency in the, the delivery of, of the uh, answer. And that's one of the things you look at when you're trying to make a decision about when, whether someone's being honest with you or not. And it can go either, it can go one of two ways. You can say there's too much time. Or you can say there's not enough time. And how do you know? Well, you have what's called what, what Greg lives on the baseline. So after you listen to this person talk for a while, then you can say, okay, well, they're answering that too quickly. 
for that, or they're, they're taking too long to answer that. And it's very subtle when you, when you, when you get into those things. So her, it's called response latency. And here it's too late when she starts too soon when she starts. So then we see her, she goes, she goes along, she uses a re, as a regulator, almost like when you say, I, when you go to court, I'm, you know, I'm, you take the oath, you're the hang, right hand goes up. I swear to God, whatever. So, but in this case, what we're saying is it almost comes up like this and she's very still when she does it. And at the same time, when she starts saying that she didn't, she gets that head tilt and she gets the head tilt before she starts shaking her head. No, because her brain is fighting that wanting to go. Yes. But it's tilting saying, as she says, no, so it's a little tough for it to get through that. These things are grouped in. One of the things I look for when I'm trying to decide if someone is being honest or if they, if they're being deceptive or they're just flat out lying as I, I group things in threes, if I see one little shoulder shrug or something, it doesn't mean anything. It, it could mean if somebody does this while they're talking, yeah, it doesn't mean anything. But you see several things at the same time, then you can say there might be something here. There might be an issue here. So the first thing we're saying when she says, uh, I didn't feel the need to, then we see a short, really quick shoulder shrug. And that's a classic sign of deception. When you see them in groups, when you see groups of things. And the second one is, this is that really fast eye flutter. It's three there may be four. I can't tell. Chase will know because I'm sure you got in there and looked real close. <laughs> Coming out of that that one shot to the next one, then you see her, her. She's already started blinking. So you see three of those as she comes through. So that'd be the next one. That's her brain. That's her thinking as she goes through that. Then the uh, request for approval as her eyebrows keep going up and coming back down. And then we see her start qualifying that answer, given the reasons why she didn't need to uh, as she went through it. So in this case, I look at that and I say, you know what? And we see uh, we'll see a. Uh, a pattern here as we go through and it's a subtle pattern, but it's a thread that runs through this. And it's these little, little groups of things we'll see. And, and that I'm sure we'll all point out chase. What do you got? Very similar to you guys, but I think there were, there was two denials here. The first denial was not having looked up what it meant to be married to a Royal. The second denial was not Googling her husband. I think the first denial was truthful. When she says, I haven't ever looked up what it meant. Of course. I mean, who's going to type that into Google? I think that was a truthful denial. But then we have the the non-contracted denial when she says did not, or uh, I think she says did not. And there's a stop gesture. Is What I think that is, is a stop gesture. And our, this is when our fingers extend, digital extension for Scott there. This is when we, we want something to stop. And even this happens to all of us. This is a natural behavior. If your hand is in your pocket and your purse down at your side, you're trying to convince someone not to do something. Try it right now. Imagine yourself in that scenario. Your fingers start to extend automatically. And that's something we do unconsciously. Failure to use name throughout the entire interview that you're going to see here tonight. And in the full, full interview, there was very little name usage. Mark? Yeah, so let me go through the cluster because, yeah, you said saw any of one of these things on their own, then you wouldn't be worried about anything. But straight out of the gate here, there is such a big cluster here that you have to go, hang on, that isn't accurate. What you, and also, look, it, honestly, it, it just begs belief. I, I Google the plumber. OK, and I'm not marrying the plumber. OK, so look, we, we Google just about everything out there. And so and so it doesn't have kind of a, a, a rational belief to it. Anyway, that said, she could be very, very special. She just doesn't Google that kind of thing. But we get, yes, look for approval in the eyebrows, one shoulder shrug, head tilts to one side. Right hand illustrator, absolutely. Then that right, um, and then Oprah comes in and helps her by repeating that. Now, there's a lot of kind of great symbiotic relationship between the two. The fact that the friend helps with the answer, comes in to save, and at the end of that, then does an adapter to the nose. But listen, when you rub your nose, doesn't mean you're lying, but that within the cluster that the friend starts joining in, that's a big cluster of information. Uh, Greg, the, the, the hitch forward and the movement of the, of the dress, I'm going to say she is adapting on the dress there. And I'm going to say that the, the reason I say this is important is this is an actress. She knows when she puts a costume on not to alter it. When you're done, you're done. You don't move. So I think it's a stress relief adapter right there. Say, all of this goes back to your friendship with Jeffrey Epstein. Mm. How did you first become friends? How did you meet? 
Well, I met through his girlfriend um, back in 1999, who, um, and I'd known her since uh, she was at university in the UK. Um, and it would be, to some extent, a stretch to say that, that um, uh, as it were, we were close friends. I mean, we were friends because of other people. Um, and I had a lot of opportunity to um, uh, go to the United States, um, but I didn't have much time with him. I suppose I saw him once or twice a year, perhaps maybe maximum of three times a year. And um, quite often, if I was in the United States and doing things, it, and if he wasn't there, he would say, well, why don't you come and use my houses? So I said, that's very kind. Thank you very much indeed. Um, but it would be, it would be um, a, a, a considerable stretch to say that he was a very, very close friend. But he had the most extraordinary um, ability to bring um, uh, extraordinary people together. Uh, and that's the bit that I remember, is going to the dinner parties where you would meet academics, politicians, people from the United Nations. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a cosmopolitan group of what I would describe as, as U.S. Um, eminence. All right, so who wants to go first? Greg? Yeah, so I'll jump on two things, and then it, it may bleed into three. Number one, you, it would be a stretch to characterize us as close friends evolves to it would be a considerable stretch to characterize us as very, very close friends. Hmm. That's an interesting distancing from the situation, number one. Here's one of those, and Chase, we'll both be on this one from different angles. This is one of those points where he's nodding very rapidly, yes, about being a friend, and then suddenly preparing because he knows what's coming, pushing his tongue out of his mouth. And this is not a grooming move as much, you know, cleaning your mouth as almost distasteful, pushing his tongue out. Of course, his routine is a little bit of that, but watching from here that first start, and you'll see as he progresses through this, fight or flight's going to start hitting him, and you'll get mucosal fatigue and all that, and we'll talk about it as it shows up. But those two things are my first two. Chase, what do you got? There's a lot here. So just focus on a couple of things. We have this lip compression, the moment that the person's name is memorized or, or mentioned. We see the lips squeezed together, which typically means withheld opinions or something's kind of being withheld. And we're also getting a little bit of a baseline here because we're starting out the video and, you know, Greg talks a lot about baseline. So we're looking, he's accessing a genuine memory and he looks over to his left. So we're kind of just starting to get this little baseline behavior. And when he says United States, he's using this hand, he's gesturing that direction when he's going to America. So these are important little things to pay attention to for the rest of the interview. His handlers have abandoned him at this point. And here's how I think we can tell that. Just look at his tie. His tie is askew. A handler would have never have let that go. So let's look at the bigger context that we have here. We're in the Royal Palace. That's not his house. That's his mother's house. It's the seat of the Crown of England. It's a place of high authority where he's trying to get extreme compliance from this interviewer. And he's trying to do it by striking awe. As you walk into that room, you just need to look at the China collection at the back. You've got priceless paintings all around you. He's basically saying you will comply because look at the authority that rests here. Um, Maitlis, uh, to counter this, has shown up in a military-style jacket, knowing, I think, so there are no accidents here. Right. There are conscious and unconscious choices. She's shown up in a military jacket, hoping for some compliance around that, that he'll see the braids, he'll see the military style, and although he's a vice admiral himself, there will be an element of compliance to that idea of military and uh, rank signals, essentially. Though, of course, we don't expect that he thinks she holds any rank. However, in the UK, she would be one of the top interviewers in hard news. So she's a strong contender here. So I just want to lay that out and just, you know, let you know, I think he's been abandoned. It was a, it was a, it was a cosmopolitan group of what I would describe as, as US um, eminence. Was that his appeal then? Was yeah. that what you, because you, you were perceived by the public as being the party prince. Was that something well, you I shared? Well, I think that's um, also um, a bit of a stretch. Um, I don't know why I've, I've, I've um, uh, collected that title because I don't, I, I never have really parted. Um, 
uh, I was single for quite a long time um, in the early 80s. Um, uh, but then after I got married, I was um, very happy. Um, and and, and I've, I've never really felt the need to go and party. And certainly going to um, Jeffrey's was not about partying. Absolutely not. We see a lot in this. We're going to see a lot in all these. Yeah. But we, we got a really good baseline here about how he has truthful conversations. He's talking about when he was younger and when he was married, he makes about 50% eye contact. So when we're talking to a person, and anytime you talk to a person, we ask them a few questions that, that are general, that they have no reason to lie to. And we see that when he's being truthful, he looks off to the side and he makes less eye contact. So he tends to make a ton, like 100% just about, of eye contact when he's trying to be a little bit deceptive. We also have another thing here. This is the first, he mentions Jeffrey's name in a very friendly way, but it's also the only time you will ever hear it. And, okay. and this is, in, in our field, this is something we call psychological distancing or severity softening, where we don't say the person's name. I did not have sex with that woman, phrases like that. Greg, what do you got? He does something I call sacred space. He's closed up and he starts to mill his hands. That's an adapter and a barrier. What you're doing, and the reason I call it sacred space, is you're taking control, giving yourself a new place, giving yourself room, and then making familiar the unfamiliar. And it is a comforting move, but also a blocking move to give yourself some room. He drops his chin, he has his chin down, his brow up, his eyes are closed, and his respiration increases. And you'll notice he's drifting, when he opens his eyes, he's drifting down to the left. Down to the left is a different place than directly left. When a person's accessing memory, typically on their left, and now this is where, Scott, I do believe in eye movement, and I do think it's powerful. You need to baseline someone. But if I ask you to calculate 15% of 980 and you try it, you're going to find an internal conversation about math going on in your head, and your eyes are going to drift slightly down into your left in most people. Now you baseline each person and figure it out, but over and over and over when he's walking through a minefield, you see that activity, that down left as he's thinking about what to say next and walking through it. I agree with you a hundred percent, Mark, that in the case of him going, yeah, he just felt a bite on the line and he's going to let her run with it. And he's teasing her to get her to go. This is a great start down the tunnel. She understands what's happening. He doesn't think she does. And the last thing I'll leave you at you can see the flirt in him here. You can certainly see the flirt when he makes eye contact and he turns his head, but still keeps eye contact and then draws that pulling taffy move. That's the flirt, right? That's the draw you into my space and make it remembering that he is after all a real prince, not a fairy tale prince, right? For most of my life, I've always felt worried, concerned, a little bit tense and uptight whenever I fly back into the UK, whenever I fly back into London. And I, I could never understand why. I was aware of it. I wasn't aware of it at the time when I was younger, but after I started doing therapy and stuff like that, I became aware of it. I was like, why do I feel so uncomfortable? And of course, for me, London is a trigger, unfortunately, because of what happened to my mum and because of what I experienced and what I saw. Yeah, so this guy has, I always say the organism does what the organism been, has been successful with. Well, guess what? He's a new organism. He has had a different life than he has now, and he has to learn some new things. Now, he's still a prince. He's still somebody famous and all of that, and he still has some friends. But he has to learn to do things a little bit differently as well. So his body language is going to change. I have a feeling just by watching and how he is not overly concerned with whether you're looking at him or not when he's thinking. When he goes into thought, his eyes drop. His hands start doing convoluted work. I, I have a feeling he's a guy who likes to be liked. You guys who keep up with him better than I would would know that. I don't know. Mark, I'm the guy who says I don't know much about this one because I don't keep up with Harry. But I watch him go into internal conversation and break eye contact and then only go back when he has something to say. Mark, love the plane landing in London. He actually draws a circle around London too. Beautiful. I mean, his he has congruent messaging in everything he's doing. So he's not trying to lie. You also don't see a lot of emotion when he's talking facts. When he hits the problem about it was a trigger, you get some of that tongue jut and some disgust and everything else there. And so there's the ball of anger. I, I again, when you're interrogating someone, you're looking for change. And that gear-like movement of his hands as he's thinking, 
to your point, Chase, would give me the opportunity that when he has something that he is telling me the truth about, he would use one set of gestures, if it's positive or negative. But when he needs to think through it and he has to create details, he's going to use his hands. And that's a tell. That's a very easy thing for you to use if you're talking to this person or someone else who, when they're negotiating something, uses their hands to show that negotiation. That's it. That's all I got. Just because you suffered, that doesn't mean that your kids have to suffer. In fact, quite the opposite. If you suffered, do everything you can to make sure that whatever experiences you, negative experiences that you had, that you can make it right for your kids. All right, I'll go first on this one. So at this point, um, I can't tell you how much I agree with what he's saying. And he, and he gets, his voice gets softer. I think this is the most important point he tries to make in the whole, in the whole series during, this, uh, during his interviews. Um, because he, his illustrators are fairly strong here. And I think he, he really believes this. What he's saying is true. And I believe it too. I believe that. I don't know if y'all dealt with or spoke with anybody that's had a situation with a, with a, a parent who has been um, like a malignant narcissist, that type of situation where it's a horrible childhood. And they, um, they, the, the child will understand later on that that's exactly, this is what he's talking about. If they're, if, if your parents were, or one of your parents were that, then you'll know exactly what this person is talking about. Um, but he's only using his left hand as he's illustrating this when he goes around at the first there, because he's, um, He's not really presenting. He's really telling what his feelings are. He's not thinking about, oh, this has got to be big and those types of things. This is coming out of his gut, I think. And I think this is what he looks like when he's at, at the dinner table. I think if you're talking to him and he's telling you something he really thought, this is what he would look like. That's why I think it's important that, that we understand he's probably good buddies with Oprah at this point. They're probably really friends because he's talking to her from, his, from a, a, a passionate place. And that's why it's soft and he's getting that across and it's different than everything, every, everything else he says and everywhere, everything else he sounds like doesn't sound like this. So I believe that's that he really, uh, he really believes that, especially when he says you can make it right for your kids. He's saying it from that, that emotional spot. And I think he's really experiencing that emotion here. I, I think it's the, 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 that, that is one of the most important parts of that whole series. One of the stories that continues to live either through rumors or social media out in the world is that you, Megan, are the one who manipulated, calculated, and are responsible for this Megxit. Oh my gosh. It's and amazing how they can use Meg for everything. Yes. There are even stories that you knew all along that this was going to happen. You went through the whole process and it was all intentional to build your brand. Can you imagine how little sense that makes? I left my career, my life. I left everything because I love him, right? And our plan was to do this forever. For us, yeah, for us for Our us plan for, us. for me, I mean, I wrote letters to his family when I got there saying, I am dedicated to this. I'm here for you. Use me as you'd like. There was no guidance as well, right? Mm -hmm. There were certain things that you couldn't do, but you know, unlike what you see in the movies, there's no class on how to, how to speak, how to cross your legs, how to be royal. There's none of that training. That might exist for other members of the family. That was not something that was offered to me. All right, I'll go first on this one. Um, when, when she says, uh, you, Megan, then you see that little head pop, she's getting ready to like, she's already in, in, in defense mode on this. I don't know if she, uh, she must think uh, Oprah's going to attack her. Oprah's not that, that, that style of, uh, interviewer. Sometimes she is and sometimes and cause she's great at it, but in this case, she's not. And then uh, while she's talking, uh, she gives that, uh, that back me up glance over to Harry. You know, she, she's going along like, back me up, man. I'm going, I'm, I'm doing this. Then as her head pops, you see his head turn and give it one of these, like, you know, are you, gonna, are you going in here? What are we doing? So they're both on, I think, what, what you would call high alert for, um, for an attack from Oprah. And, um, and Harry, you see this little bitty, micro, I'm not even sure, I'm not going to call it a micro, micro expression of anger, but boy, it sure, it sure looks like it. There's so much going on with his face. Doesn't look like a whole lot's going on most of the time, but. When he gets in there, I can't I can't decide through these little ticks he has, or if it's actually these little uh, micro expressions, and then they're both sitting very still as they go through this, really still because they're waiting for an attack as they go through this. I guess it's really their first big interview they've done with anybody, so they're waiting for the big bombs to drop. But Oprah's I don't Oprah's not that style of uh, interview. Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah, so agree. Chaff and redirect. She doesn't answer the question. Can you imagine Megan? They use Megan for everything. Got it. Yeah, she just runs away with the question. Interestingly for me is watching his body language. When she asked the question in the beginning, I see pub act. I, if I were in a pub and saw a guy go like this, you know something's coming. That's pre-aggression when you're in those situations. So I think he is, he's a little like, hold on a second. He cocks his head a little bit, looks at her, and then he realizes, hey, it's not an attack. But you see there's conflict body language for sure there. He does kind of a half smile there. So he's got asymmetric behavior and we know asymmetric behavior is never positive. Works his jaw a little bit. All of that's conflict preparation. All of that's conflict preparation. At the end of the day, when she says there are no classes or maybe other people get it, watch him rifle through his Rolodex of visual memory to see if there are classes that other people have gotten. See his eyes go up left as he's trying to recall. Is there a class for other people that she just didn't get exposed to? So interesting to watch. I think he was ready to your point, Scott. He was ready to hammer. And then he realized, oh no, I don't have to do that. And he backed down. He is, however, barriering, meaning barriers mean I need space. I put something between me and you. And you see it increase in him here and doing some adapting. And I refer to that as sacred space. I've left it out in a few places here. I'll bring it up from now on. But if you watch in the coming videos, you'll see it progressively more. There's also going to be some more subtle nuance com communication coming up soon. Um, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I think Oprah kind of does her lawyer act. You, and, and it's a surprising tone. And therefore, I think, yes, Megan is surprised by that. Yeah, Harry does come in with the ear, his breathing rate goes up as well. So he's like, hang on, what's going on? What's going on here? So yes, he's getting ready for aggression. Um, she looks for support, uh, corner of his mouth raises in response to her. Um, but then once he realizes it's okay, he goes back and he locks down into what I would say is kind of his interrogation pose. I think he knows how to handle himself in these situations because I think he's been trained in a number of places how to handle himself. And, and he is locked down hard. It's nice to see that there's this lovely little moment where he opens up his thumbs. He kind of does an open palm gesture, but perception of, of you. And, and isn't it a wonderful um, location that they have there, which is essentially a walled garden or what we call a paradise. Paradise simply means walled garden, somewhere which is beautiful, which the rest of the world can't get into. It's interesting that they have set themselves up in for, to be interviewed about their actions, you know, out in the world within this location of the paradise. So there's a weird kind of juxtaposition there between royalty and the rest of us. And yet there aren't any classes for how to be royal. Uh, there are classes for them in how to kind of fit in a little bit better with everybody else at public occasions. And it's interesting. So Harry is wearing a, a Ludlow suit from J. Crew. Uh, I don't know if anybody out there knows about J. Crew. The Ludlow suit is not a super expensive suit. It's not like he went to German Street and got himself a suit or Savile Row. And it's a kind of a very ordinary suit that's equated with, you know, one of your first jobs, you go and get yourself a J. Crew uh, suit, maybe. So he's really kind of lowering the idea of his status to, you know, just ordinary guy, ordinary guy from out there. And yet there they are in this paradise. So what an extraordinary uh, scene to evoke the idea of out there uh, in the world, the sense of... Um, their life is not of the world of us uh, ordinary people. There you go. You wanted freedom from, from that life. You wanted freedom to make your own money. You wanted freedom to make deals with Netflix and Spotify, but you also wanted to yeah. serve the queen. No, we didn't, want to, we didn't want to give up or we didn't want to turn our backs on these, uh, the associations and the people that we'd, that we'd been supporting. But also, yeah. oh, it, ex it, but, oh, it exists. Yeah, but it exists. But also, it, but also the, the Netflix and the Spotify of it all, that was never part of the plan. Yeah, because you didn't have a plan. We didn't we have, have a plan. plan. That, was, that was suggested by somebody else by the, by the point of where my family literally cut me off financially and I had to afford, afford security for, for us. Wait, hold, hold up, wait a minute. Your family cut you off? Yeah, in the first half, the first quarter of 2020. But... I've got what my mum left me. And yeah. without that, we would not have been able to do this. All right, uh, Greg, what do you got? 
Yeah, if I were choosing a set to put them in awkward positions, I couldn't choose better chairs for a guy his height. I don't know how tall he is. I'm long arm, long leg. I would be miserable in that chair. But it allows him to do some goofy body language that if he had good handlers, they probably would have said, no, he's not sitting in that chair. If I were coaching him or Mark were coaching him or Chase or Scott, we would all say, nope, not sitting in that chair because it's going to be way too visible when he moves around, number one. Number two, I started off talking about culture way back in the beginning of this show. Go all the way back. Now I'm going to show you a microculture in action. If you notice, they have their hands together. This is controlling. Couples have signaling with their hands that they don't have to talk about. They probably did talk about it in the beginning. Chase, you talked about last time her restating her comment without touching him as a regulator. What a regulator is is a way to control conversation, those things. Well, couples, because they can hold hands and it doesn't look awkward. Now, if Scott and I or Chase and I were sitting holding hands and squeezing, people might look at us differently unless we were a couple. Then maybe they wouldn't notice. But when a couple's together, they can squeeze their fingers and make things happen and understand. So we're talking along and she goes, but it exists. Not even covertly. He reaches over and slaps her on the hand figuratively and says, shut up, honey. It's time for me to talk. That tells you that this is not a person who is dominating absolutely. This is a partnership. These guys are talking back and forth and they're communicating about who owns what. Now, I can't speak to inside their relationship except for what I can see. And I can clearly see that. There's hidden communication going on. There's a body language of microculture. Remember, culture is everything. And then he says, yeah, and sinks back in his chair, exasperation. I think he actually is exasperated with the fact he lost money. One other thing that he said, we didn't want to give up. That's a telling story. We didn't want to leave our friends is kind of the way I would say about if I had to leave something. Not we didn't want to give up. Give up what? Give up power? Give up something comfortable? This is a bad time for them. Make no mistake. Then she says, you didn't have a plan. It's almost comical how quickly Megan jumps on. We didn't have a plan. It's almost like a life ring to me. Like, yes, we didn't have a plan. Thank you. I don't think there's a rehearsal or something going back and forth, but she's going to take advantage of that. The other thing to watch him do, because he has this hand on Megan, his other hand is doing the fig leaf, putting his hand in front of his crotch. And he's also adapting and moving his hand. So he's doing three pieces of uncomfortable body language at the same time. Well, he's doing two. He's doing sacred space, fig leaf, his hands in front of him, and adapting as he rubs his leg. So my, my version of that sacred space, blocking. So when you put your hands in front of you, you're making space. When you wiggle your fingers, you're making that space comfortable. There's a lot going on here. I do believe his, he's exasperated. I do believe they cut him off. Candidly, he was out of the, if you go back and look at the timeline, he was already out of the royal family at that point. So I think it's okay that he was out of the royal family. Um, now, um, there's a chop illustrator on cut off. However, he doesn't chop as if something is cut off. He shows decline. Okay, so I don't think he was truly cut off. I think there was a decline in his uh, revenue. Uh, he's probably talking about his decline in revenue, a, a, a drift off of revenue from the, the Duchy of Cornwall, which is his dad's um, uh, land and, and interests. Again, some more leg rubbing, self-soothe, and then he sinks back. Ah, in what I think, I don't know, to correct me if I'm right or wrong on this, uh, Greg or, 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 or Chase or Scott, but it looked a bit almost like pre-confession to me. It's like, okay, I'm going to admit it. I had to use my mum's money that she gave me. Now, this was an important package of, of money. There is some significance around this because uh, the legend goes that Diana left this estate money because she was always worried that they would not be looked after and they would need this money. They must always be looked after from outside of the royal family because she worried about this very moment. Well, so it's, it's, it's laden as he sinks back with that and says, yes, the emergency money that Diana gave had to be used. There's just some interesting stories here around Oprah and the idea of freedom, and then Harry and the idea of responsibility. That, yes, you want freedom, you want all this freedom, that Harry going, but we wanted actually to have the responsibility and take the responsibility. So again, being forced away 
uh, not into freedom, but just they were not allowed to have the responsibilities or, or supported in those uh, responsibilities. Just for the record, you've been on his private plane. Yes. You've been to stay on his private island. Yes. You've stayed at his home in Palm Beach. Yes. You visited Gellin Maxwell's house in Belgravia in London. Yes. All right. What do you got, Chase? So to, to Greg's point, one thing when we look at eye movement, uh, what I call, for just me personally, I call it home. Where is someone's home when we ask him a question of what happened a certain day? Their, his home is to our right, somewhere near the middle area. And when we ask somebody a geographical location, when we ask them to imagine visual things or geography, they typically look another direction. So we get another sense of that here when we ask him where it was and he was making sure. So his to his up and left is a little geographical area. And maybe all we're doing is just kind of collecting some data points here. But we see that completely accurate, instantaneous, yeah, yep, yep. And during those, there's some eye blocking going on. And we kind of close our eyes during some, we're recalling something emotional or recalling something that we really don't want to. But right at the end, when they're talking about the house in London, you see him say yes, followed by an immediate eye flutter behavior afterwards, which I think shows that something happened there. And if I'm the interviewer, that's the moment that I push the shovel into the dirt. I'm going to start digging the moment that I see that eye flutter, because there was one behavior, one behavior, one behavior, and then we see a flutter in response to the other one. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to add something to that because I think there's something really important going on here with the third question there when he says yes to that. The, um, the first time, first question she asked him, he said, he closed his eyes two times and we've talked before about, uh, and Chase, you call it the, when the lens closes really quickly because you're waiting to look at something really quick. So shutter. you're, you're, yeah, the shutter speed of your eyes. He's just relaxed. That first one, yeah, everything's cool. He's got two blinks there. The second question, four. All right, a little bit more. And on the third one, he only goes to two, but there's so much going on in that third thing. Something's up. Something has happened at that house. Something's going on there because here's what, here's what we see. When uh, she asked that, the first one, yes, his lips purse a little bit. He's like, ah, here we go. She's going to nail me for, for being at these places. That's understandable. And then when he gets to the third one, um, when he talks about the, the home in, uh, what is it, Palm Beach, the right side of his upper lip goes up a little bit, like in, in contempt or disdain or whatever. We see that go a bit, and his cheek as well. We see that, we'll get into micro expressions for a minute. We're not really doing that because these things are so big. So let's, but let's, let's dial down on some of this stuff. And um, I think something either bad happened there, something's not right there. It's the only place where, when he answers these, his eyebrows go up. He looks for that. I don't know if he's looking for approval or, or what's going on there. Greg, you'll have to look, you have to, you have to see that again, but there's something going on there. It's the only time we see that the bottom parts of the whites of his eyes, his eyes open so wide, we can see those. That's the only time we see that he's running something, something in there has happened <clears throat> because we're seeing that, that almost <clears throat> um, Pavlov's re Pavlov reaction to that to that question when that word comes up. He's like, bang, something happens there very quickly. Uh, that he may be ready for that, I can't tell. But um, that's the only time his eyebrows lift that high. And it's and it's his longest delay before he answers. All the other ones are just like the rhythm is right there. It's, he's loping. But when he hits that one, it, there's a there's a slight, just a little longer of a pause before he before he answers. So I would say something's up there. Either he had a bad experience there or he was afraid he was going to get busted there or some, something's up with that situation. I don't know what it is. Maybe we'll find out later on. But I would, I would try to remember that the, the, um, the Palm Beach house because I think something's up there. I think something's up there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so let's just look at the tonality of, of those yeses because they're a good baseline. If we, if we take away everything that we're seeing, he goes, um, yes. Yes, yes. All the tonalities are the same around that. A great baseline for us uh, to, to judge that he's telling the truth there. Very different from what we heard before was, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
very different. Now, absolutely, we see on that third one, those eyes dart across and, and all of us there are going, well, there's something up there. Well, uh, I think there are two things up. Number one is we're going to find out there's a photograph for a start. Okay, there's a picture taken in that place but there's something up as well because he already has his argument for that. He already has his argument for that and he gave away his argument at the start, which is that I do remember, but other stuff he just doesn't recall. He doesn't remember. And so I think that data cross is number one about, ah, yeah, that's, that's the place with the photograph and I've got my solution. I've got my way out of that one. I don't remember it. And then we're going to go into a whole bunch of stuff around the idea that if you can't prove that a photograph isn't fake, it could be. Yeah, hey, Greg. I think you are starting to see real fight or flight here. He does a mouth grooming move. If you notice this, where he pushes his tongue. There's a reason you're doing that. Protein builds up in your mouth from stress and mucous membranes start to decay fairly quickly without blood flow and then things dry up and then a little bit of mucus comes in and the next thing you know, you got this stringy garbage producing in your mouth and you self-groom. I've seen that thousands of times. In sear, I would see protein build up in the corners of your mouth. You get white protein caked up in the corners of your mouth because of the level of stress. That's a really bad indicator that a person is in fight or flight that you'll probably never see in your life. But here you're seeing it in a very wealthy person who is under high stress from a different cause. That internal mouth groom grooming is because he's dry in the mouth. He may not have protein breakdown yet, but he's certainly, or mucous membrane, but he's certainly feeling the, the effects of fight or flight. Number one, I think the quick glance is because he's prepared very well to answer, yes, I did this, yes, I did this, yes, I did this. And I think to your guys' point, he has a plan for how he is going to unfold the story. And this is one of those moments I don't want to jump ahead that far. I think he has a plan. And so you see that movement. Otherwise, you guys have covered everything except respiration is ramping rapidly now. Fight or flight, you see the nostrils flaring, see the skin getting lighter. And the best part of this whole thing is he's aging as you watch him. His face is looking older by the minute. So that by the end of this, and guys, we're seven minutes in, and you're seeing his <laughs> eyes bagging, his face sagging. All of those things that you expect from a president who goes through this, but not in seven minutes. You're seeing a difference in his face. The stress is there. You're in London. Yes. So in 2006, in May, an arrest warrant was issued for Epstein for sexual assault of a minor. Yes. In July, he was invited to Windsor Castle to your daughter, Princess Beatrice's 18th birthday. Why would you do that? Because I was asking Ghislaine. But even so, at the time, I don't think I... Um, certainly, I wasn't aware when the invitation was issued what was going on in the United States. And I wasn't aware until, until the media picked up on it, because he never said anything about it. We see more severity softening here. And severity softening for, for you watching, it's, this is so one of the most common things when we do an interrogation for somebody that's guilty. They don't want to say murder. They'll say hurt. They don't want to say steal. They'll say take. They don't want to say rape. They'll, they'll say have sex with. So we'll soften the severity of everything. And it's so, so deep here that he doesn't say, when I found out about the sex ring, he just says, when I found out about what was happening in America. So this is, this is a big deal to look for in the, in the next few videos. Anybody else want to have anything they want to add to this before we get out of here? Just, just stay tuned because if you thought that was pretty bad, it was warm it's up. a lot worse. <laughs> did, did you worry that he had something that could compromise you? No, no. Do you regret that trip? Yes. Happened. She provided a photo of yes. the two of you together. Yes. Your arm was around her waist. Yes. You've seen the photo. I've seen the photograph. How do you explain that? Uh, you want to go first, Mark? 
Yeah, so it, we could also baseline that with um, some of the yeses that he gave earlier around places that he'd been as well. And we talked about those in the, in the first episode. And it, let's just look at it simply. Let's just say you've got upward intonation and downward intonation. I mean, it's a little more complex than that, but let's make it really simple. You know, there's the rising tone, yeah, which, which often can signal, signal an idea of there's something coming next or that's a question, not a statement. There's another, a, another bunch of things as well, but let's keep it relatively simple. So, so his, his uh, no's or yeses will tend to illustrate that there is probably something else there and it is not emphatic. An emphatic no will be no. An emphatic yes will be yes. In fact, uh, loud and downward intonation we tend to call command tonality, which I'm doing for you right now. And questioning tonality will be up like this and suggests there's something coming next, which is why it kind of keeps you on this kind of hiatus and, and gets quite annoying after a while if I carry on making statements. But having that upward forehead while he's doing that, I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so let me leave it at, at, at that because I just think it's, it's, it's a good teachable element to just see tonality in simple forms of there's up, or there's down, and down could be seen as more decisive, and up could be seen as there's something more to come, or I don't quite know. Excellent. Chase, what do you got? If you're about to get hit, and you know someone's about to hit you, you're going to turn your head and look at them. And with everything here, if, if we know somebody who turns out to be a disgusting human being, like Epstein, you will be comfortable saying it. We'll be comfortable saying the act. We'll be comfortable saying the person's name. We'll be comfortable saying it's disgusting. I hate it. I denounce all of those things, which never happens once in this video. And it culminates with what I think here is one of the key factors that, that runs this whole thing. When she says, are you worried he had something that he could use to ruin your reputation? His whole body's frozen. There's a tiny no. And maybe the, the verbal stuff isn't there, but the rest of the evidence throughout the entire conversation really does spell out that if I'm worried that there's a video that might get leaked somewhere, I will definitely not, I'm not going to talk about that person in a negative light ever. And I can't, I can ever, I can never denounce what they do, what they did. And I'm going to use their name as little as possible in the interview, bring as little attention to the person who has a gun pointed at my head as possible. You said that you love your brother and always will love your brother. You didn't tell me what the relationship is now, though. Um, the relationship is space at the moment. And, you know, time heals all things, hopefully. Any regrets? No, I mean, no, I, I think we've done, I'm really proud of us, you know? Um, I'm so proud of, I'm so proud of my wife, like, she safely delivered Archie during a period of time which was so cruel and so mean. And every single day I was coming back from work from London, I was coming back to my wife crying while breastfeeding Archie. Mm. That's coming from someone who wasn't reading anything. And as she touched on earlier, if she had have read anything, she wouldn't be here now. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so he starts off barriered against the threat. He's shrunk forward a little bit. He's all crunched up. His legs are crossed. I mean, to your point, Mark, it looks like a good resistance posture. He's sitting there doing something. He mouth grooms a little bit at the start because he's feeling a little stress. Uh, as he's talking about the relationship, he goes down left to navigate, and his hands punctuate perfectly space. So it's what he's thinking as he goes. Here's the piece that's interesting for me. He says, time heals all things, hopefully. And he does request for approval and withheld opinion, or what I would call emotional uh, compression or emotional control, lack of emotion. So I don't think he believes that this is going to get healed. Hmm. Clue. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, yeah, I'm with you on those. I think I know what you're pointing to on that one, Greg, as to what this might be a clue uh, around. Uh, the relationship is space. I don't think I've ever... <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, 
uh, talked about a relationship in terms of kind of a conceptual model. Uh, it is so far departed from most of our ideas around how you talk about a relationship that I think there's something uh, extraordinary happening in this particular re relationship at the time. Um, so mean. A period of time which was so cruel and so mean. And I think we see anger at that point. What would have had to have gone on for the relationship to be space? <laughs> that, yeah, I'm wondering, what would have caused that? Chase, what do you got? So I think uh, what we're seeing here is Oprah's question about regrets is another way to elicit a locus of control. So as a super fast recap, a locus of control is, do I control what happens to me or am I controlled by external factors? That's kind of how we, we either have an internal or an external locus of control. I teach a course for uh, mostly women on how to identify narcissists really fast. And this is one of those things we ask, what went wrong in X relationship or, you know, uh, what did you learn the most about yourself and people who have no regrets, I'm not saying he's a narcissist, but people who have no regrets have that external locus of control. I'm a victim. I didn't do anything wrong ever. I've never done anything wrong. Everybody's got regrets. If you're breathing in and out as you watch this video, you've got regrets. Every human does. And it's interesting to say no regrets, did nothing wrong, tried everything. We did nothing wrong. Everyone else is wrong except for us. Uh, strange way to, to sell uh, the video. And when he says, I'm really proud of us, it's immediate request for approval, not from Megan, but from Oprah, I thought was interesting. And the first attribute he mentioned was his wife's ability to give birth, which I thought was was interesting. His hand even gestured towards her, her belly uh, when he was mentioning how proud he was of her. But after the, the rest of his compliment, it, Megan turns back to Oprah with this uh, this pride look on her face. Like, how about that? It's almost like uh, that's what you're hearing. And this was all honest to a degree, but I think it shows a serious issue with the unit, the couple unit with a uh, locus of control and, and not owning at least let's own maybe 0.03% own that much of what's going on. And that might help a little bit. Scott. Yeah. And, and like, I agree with you, Chase. I, like I was saying at the beginning, we're seeing this thread of narcissism run through here. This, and, and this is a perfect example of it as well. Not that we didn't, nothing is we did is wrong. Everything, you know, everything's fine. And in a couple of minutes, she's going to turn it say, and put it all on him here toward the end. But one thing I did see when uh, you guys have covered everything else. So one thing I did see when she said, do you have any regrets? His hand flips over. Now, when you're speaking with someone, especially, um, and uh, you know, you, you read Mark's books, and it's all about the open-handed gestures and all that. But the risks are very important because when when women feel safe, and they're and speaking of women, Chase, when women feel safe, you'll you'll see, and they're attracted to someone, you'll see that the the wrist will be bared quite often. You'll see the open hand, but you'll also see the wrist as well. And when she says this uh, about, do you have any regrets? His hand flips over. Maybe it's just a, a thing he's going for a comfort thing or whatever, or, or as an adapter, but, but, or to make himself more comfortable. But that's the one that caught my eye. And that was really the big one that stood out for me. Scott, to your point, the moment as, as one of us who doesn't just know interrogation stuff and influence, but we, we know a lot about behavior, the moment that wrist flips over, if I'm doing the interview, probably if you guys are, I say, do you have any regrets? And your wrist flipped over. And I say, well, you know what? There's a Columbo uh, thing involved there. But I say, you know what, just, I mean, what is your number one thing that you, you wish you could have done differently? And then I'll take that opportunity to re-paraphrase the question to give them an opportunity to save some face and continue to answer. Yeah, cool. My mother was chased to her death while she was in a relationship with someone that wasn't white. <laughs> and now look what's happened. You want to talk about history repeating itself? They're not going to stop until she dies. 
Okay, uh, Greg, what do you got? Here's the failure. Here's what causes all of his grief. This is the whole thing around his mother. And he is now talking in feelings, not facts, because I'm going to say a couple of things people may or may not be offended by. But if his mother were dating Mickey Mouse, people would have chased her to her death still because she was the hot photo. In those days, you have to remember back, she was probably the commodity for getting photos of. And now I don't think it was because she was dating Dodi Fayed or one of those. That might be why the whole thing unfolded the way it did. But I think now he's talking feelings and you can see it in his face. You start to lose all of that illustrating in that way that he was doing before. He does that right hand when he's being very aggressive about it. He does that and she was, wasn't was white and he does the sniff again. That, with someone that wasn't white. That's his kind of anger or frustration. And you're starting to see this ball of anger piece that's tied up in there. And the hemispherical ge gesturing changes. So Chase, I'll leave you to talk to details about what that is. And then he sets his jaw. He's making an emphatic point here. Um, this is where you're starting to see the fracture show up. That's all I got. Um, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you on the, on the gesture. We see a small change here when there's a shift to anger. And uh, of course, this is a horrible and disgusting tragedy that happened to his mom. Uh, and if we were trying to lay low from the press, uh, I'm not an expert, but Oprah is probably not the best place to do that. And uh, that's just my opinion. Uh, there's more gestural confirmation of GHT, though. We still see negative left, some positive on the right. So I know if I am interviewing a babysitter who's going to watch my kids and i know that that's she gestures to her right which is my left i'm going to step that way once i start needing to get more sensitive information about her background or once i need to ask a little more pointed questions i want her looking moving and uh, referencing that side of her body and it's it's a, a little bit hard to hear but you can hear a little sniff there like mark was talking about in the previous video this little this little stopping what's going on and i'm sure peaches uh may come into play here in just a second so mark what do you got yeah let me tell you about uh about peach because what we do get on this is someone who wasn't white we get clear disgust okay and then we get peaches snort out on that which is her aggressive snort when she wants to tell you, look, I'm in charge here. I'm a really aggressive. She's only like, she's tiny, you know, <laughs> but every now and again, she likes to go, look, I I'm in charge here. Usually when she wants to play, usually when she's like, come on, play. And you're like, I'm not playing. She's like, <clears throat> yeah. So, 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 so yeah, you get a little kind of peach snort from him uh, there. Quite aggressive. Now, here's the thing that really interests me, and there's a lot of ways we can take this. And again, hopefully this will illustrate for you how we might think about, how we might critically think what's going on. He says, um, he says about the, these uh, aggressors around him who, who hunted, hunted his mother uh, and, and, and will be the aggressors around his, his wife, and he points up to them. Now, is that because when this happened to his mother, all aggressors were always taller than him? He's a young child. Is it because it's a metaphor of power and therefore these people who are aggressors are always more powerful than him? So is it the press hunting and they're always more powerful and and above or is it some other hierarchical organization who he feels are uh hunting and therefore are going to be always above regardless regardless of our stature of actual physical height we still and this is across the world you will find no culture which does this differently we still have the idea of anything high up is of higher status and anything lower down and lower to the ground is of lower status. That's why we have um, tech titans because they literally live in the, in the sky. That's why our gods are up there and our demons are down below. That's why when we wanna take a society, a group and go there really bad, we'll call them vermin or dogs or you know leeches or something close to the, to the ground. 
well, he's using that same, is it that he's using that same metaphor there of going, they are of higher status, or is he regressing to a child and going, you know, the press or whoever was in power around my mother and hunted her down, they were always taller than me. I don't know the answer to that, but it's kind of interesting that he places, he does not place the power on a level to him. He makes them higher than him. There, that's what I got for you there. Uh, another guest was John Brockman, uh, the literary agent. Now, he described really? seeing you there getting a foot massage from a young Russian woman. Did that happen? No. You're absolutely sure or yeah, you can't remember? I'm absolutely sure. So John Brockman's statement is false? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't know Mr. Brockman, so I don't know what he's talking about. But that definitely wasn't you getting a foot massage from a Russian girl in Jeffrey Epstein's house? Mm, no. It... <laughs> All right, yeah, so now it doesn't sound like, a, you know, you think foot massage, what a big deal. But when you see, I watched the first episode of this Epstein thing, Greg and I both, both watched it. When you see that first episode, you'll realize why that's an important part here. Why that's a, that's a key to what's, to what's happening in that house. You know, and some other things that I, I see going on along, you know, of course, you've got that head tuck, but when you see his, when you pay attention to his blink rate, and I don't want to step on you, Chase, because I know a lot of times we'll, everybody covers the same things. We try to stay out of each other's way. So if I'm not stepping on your blink rate thing, not at all. It's, it's, it plummets. I think he blinks three times during this whole thing because he's making sure she's believing him. So if he has to add any qualifiers and, and uh, then you start looking at, um, he never says no when she asks him. She says, "So Brockman." In other words, "So Brockman's lying." He never says no. He, he starts. He starts talking, but he never says no, which is, of course, one of the biggies from that. And his movement, compared overall, in this thing, he's almost like a statue compared to the way he is in the in the rest of the um, interview. He doesn't move hardly at all. He does some, but not not much at all. So I think that's important as well because he's taken in all that information. The only thing I didn't see in there was his eyes get really big, which I kept ex I kept expecting that. As you'll see when somebody, you get him, he's got the head turn as it's going, but he doesn't, the eyes don't get really big, you know. But all this after that big fake surprise he throws on. I think the surprise was genuine, and I think it might be in reaction to, oh, crap, that guy said something or Maybe I didn't know. know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can see if we go back, you can see the sclera, the, the white part of our eyeballs above and below the iris, the little colored circle, which, which is kind of hard to fake, especially if you're under a lot of stress. And we see if, if anybody watching this, if I accused you of doing something that you didn't do, You'd say that statement's absolutely false. We none of us would have a problem calling someone else a liar if it was false. And then again, if I have guilty knowledge about something, then a foot massage sounds really dirty. But if it's just a foot massage and I don't feel guilty about anything else, I, what's the harm in saying, "Yeah, that was me. I was getting a foot massage." Yeah. She made these claims in a U.S. deposition, mm -hmm. are you saying you don't believe her? She's lying. That's a very difficult thing to um, answer because I'm not in a position to know um, uh, what what she's trying to um, uh, achieve, but because I can tell you categorically. I don't remember meeting her at all. I do not remember a photograph being taken. And I've said consistently and, um, and frequently that we never had any sort of sexual contact, whatever. Once again, he's going for the, he's repeating the same, that same thing all over again. And the classic line that tells me that, that he knows he's in trouble because he says, and I always hate to bring up Anthony Weiner, but Anthony Weiner is one of my favorites to, to just wail on. But when he says, um, I can tell you this, he can't tell us anything else because they're going to get him in trouble. He's going to go to prison or whatever. And that's usually what happens. But he's saying, I can tell you this. And that's the part that's going to, that, that 
is going to that supposedly shows that he's not being deceptive, that he's being that he's telling the truth. I can tell you this: Why can't he tell us anything? Why can't he tell us any more? Because if he does tell us any more, if he tells us anything besides that, he's going to be in trouble. What do you think about that, Chase? Well, back just a few minutes ago, he said he doesn't remember her, and now he's talking about not having sex with her. So that's that's a little change here. And we also see, obviously, I'm sure everybody saw it, he's failing to answer the question completely. Any one of us, any normal human being would say, absolutely, she's guilty of perjury. She has perjured herself and none of that stuff is true. And we see a little bit more psychological distancing here. He's failing to use the name of the victim. And he's also saying sexual contact instead of sex. So anybody who is accusing or an innocent person has no problem saying those words. They have no problem saying the criminal t type of words, the more severe words to describe a crime. What do you got, Greg? Yeah, so a few things. You're dead on. No denial at all. First of all, did you have sex with that woman? No. I'm going to run over a couple, but here is the Bill Clinton statement. I have said consistently and frequently we had no sex. We, we had never had any sexual contact, whatever. That's I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. That is his statement in the same way that Bill Clinton did. Doesn't say he's lying. Says it's a prepared and canned statement that he's worked on. He probably had an attorney working with him to make sure he said the right things. He also then, we pick up on the same things a lot of times, Chase. He said, instead of no recollection, this. No recollection, I have no recollection of that woman has been his argument all along. He's off a little bit off the reservation there. And then when he says, I categorically deny, this is one of the few times he does a straight down eye contact break, which we typically think of as submission. They know they're on the griddle and those eyes break straight down. That's not accessing. Nobody accesses like that that I've ever seen in my life. You may access this way, that way, this way, this way. But that's breaking eye contact in a submissive fashion. Odd for him. First time I've seen it. Chase? I think that there is a legitimate concern from the prince that there is something or someone out there that has information that could seriously hurt him. And what one question I would have loved to ask, and this is something that all interrogators, most interrogators know, this is, why do you think people do this kind of thing? I would have loved to hear his response and whether or not he denounced this stuff because it was never it was never really brought under the light, and that that might have been a mandate for the interview. Like we're gonna we can talk about all this, but we're not gonna bring this up. But I would have loved to bring that into light and say, why do you think people do this kind of thing, and get a reaction, and that would be really telling at the very beginning of the interview. Megan shared with us that there was a conversation with you about Archie's skin tone. Mm -hmm. What was that conversation? That conversation <laughs> I'm never going to share. Um, but at the time, at the time it was awkward. I was a bit shocked. Um, can, you, can you tell us what the question was? No, I don't, I'm not comfortable sharing that. Okay. Um, but that was, that was right at the beginning, right? Um, like, what will the baby look like? Yeah, what will the kids look like? Yeah, what will yeah. the kids look like? But um, that was right at the beginning when she wasn't going to get security, when members of my family were suggesting that she carries on acting because there's not enough money to pay for her and all this sort of stuff. Like, there were some real obvious signs before we even got married that this was going to be really hot. Mm. But we see an immediate shift to internal dialogue here. And the cool thing about this is it happens during the question. So while he's being asked the question, there's a shift to internal dialogue, which means it's more likely to be deceptive. Second, there's a short giggle before he says he's not going to share this. And I think he's borrowing this behavior from his father, who does this a lot. We talked about this. And... I think he's borrowing this behavior because he's borrowing it from an authority figure. This helps him to deliver the story with a little bit more authority. He says the words awkward and shocked. His hands are fidgeting like crazy. He's not comfortable sharing it, but shares it in a way to paint the picture that he exactly needs. He says, I'm not comfortable sharing it and then shares it anyway, which I think is uh, pretty interesting. 
And he says, when he's confirming, yeah, what will the kids look like? There's a single-sided shoulder shrug there, which indicates he lacks confidence in what he's saying. And the signs that he's talking about do not involve horrible conversation. He simply adds those in afterward, the other signs that he's talking about. He adds them in afterward to give the first thing more credibility. Greg, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, so here's one of those rare times that we don't see the same thing. Chase, when I see the guy looking down to, now remember, I'm an eye movement guy, so I'm, I'm all over eye movement. Yes, he is looking down, but instead of being down to the left, he's down to the right. And down to the right is where we store emotion. If this is truly an emotional moment for him, it would be there. He would be talking from fact. Now, he may have to access back up if he were telling us the words used, but the feelings, when you're talking about feelings, and I'll get a great example again. Think about the last funeral you went to. Think about the last emotional moment in your life. Watch your eyes drift heavy. They make your head heavy. They make your whole body language shift. So I, I trust that body language in this case. And then he does a contempt half smile and exposes his teeth, which is kind of out of baseline for him because he doesn't show his teeth a whole lot for some reason, whatever that reason is. He adapts it awkward. I agree. He adapts very much there. And then he says, that was right at the beginning, right? Tongue jut. This is not, and there. this is a transference. Let's assume this happened. I, I don't see a reason not to right here. Let's assume it happened. Oprah, and Megan are talking about Archie. He's not, he's not talking about Archie. He's talking about her. He's saying somebody said something about her and what color his kids would be. The transference then, of course, is yes, that's Archie. But I don't think this conversation occurred about an unborn baby. It occurred uh, prior to marriage. And I would be interested to hear what he says and see if I'm right there. But I think this is the beginning of the fracture. And this is what brings that 12-year-old kid back into the picture. So... For me, I see here that I believe somebody said something to him along those lines. And he's not telling us exact words, but all the body language is there for me to believe that he, somebody did say this to him. Do you still feel controlled by them, the media? Do they still have a hold on you feeling controlled? Um, no, they, they're desperately trying to control the narrative because they know that if they lose it, then the truth will come out. Now to the ironies. This is kind of ironic here, I would suggest that the media is asking somebody if somebody feels controlled by the media. So, so you know, either the irony isn't seen here or the question there needs to be a, a little less general. Because, you know, if, if the person in the media who organizes this media doesn't see themselves as the area of the media that have been um, uh, brutal uh, to Harry, it would be fair to kind of go, I want to, you know, mark myself out from the general media, though I am part of the media, and just kind of, you know, pull it away from that. Well, that's quite complex. And I think what we've got here is because it's 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 a great piece of entertainment. It's a great show. Is it? It's lacking maybe some of the complexity here of trying to unpack uh, what's really happening here. So, so that's that's quite an irony. And then what comes after that is you know what we'd expect in a really good piece of entertainment, which this is, it'll, it'll, if it hasn't got them already, it'll have fantastic ratings, is what we call a grand narrative or a meta narrative. What we start to get, get, what gets put forward here is now an overarching nemesis, the media, yeah? Now, this is probably not quite accurate. My guess is the accuracy is, is some, but not all of the specific media. But that's a little too complex. Go for the simplicity. Go for the big overarching grand narrative of the media against the victim. Because when you have a big overarching grand narrative, you've got an oppressor and you have a victim. I'm not saying that grand narratives don't have an edge of truth to them, but they're often not that factual in every situation. So I just want to point that out to you is what I'm seeing there is a grand narrative and we will see this come further down. We saw it in the last interview with Oprah and Harry and, and Meghan. Why do we see it? Because it is fantastic 
entertainment and these grand narratives help us understand ourselves. That's really kind of what the royal family is partly there to do, is help us understand our own families. But we should be careful of not making these grand narratives uh, an actual accurate truth rather a more a generalized way of seeing ourselves. The royal family are kind of like a fairground mirror that we hold up to ourselves. So it all gets a little wobbly and distorted and you, uh, but hopefully by looking in that fairground mirror, you have a bit of fun, you have a bit of a laugh, it's really entertaining for a bit. And sometimes you can self reflect and go, yeah, you know, that is a bit like me and my family. Maybe I should think about that. Nothing wrong with a grand narrative, but you do have to call it out. What you've described here today, being trapped and not even being aware of it and all the things that it transpired and then she comes into your life and then you're doing therapy. Do you think in some way she saved you? Yeah, with, without question. There was, there was a bigger purpose. There was other forces at play. I think, throughout this whole process. I'm the last person to think, ooh, yeah. <laughs> you know? But it's undeniable when these things have happened, where the overlap is. So, yeah, she did, without, yeah, without question, she saved and me. I would, I would, I mean, I, I think that's lovely. I would disagree. <laughs> I think he saved all of us, mm. right? He ultimately called it and was like, we've got to find a way for us, for Archie, and you made a decision that saved, well, certainly saved my life um, and saved all of us. But, you know, you need to want to be saved. All right. I'll go first on this one. This is what I was talking about at the very beginning. We see that the thread of narcissism that's run through here. This is where she turns it all and puts all the blame that's happened to everything where that goes because it doesn't look like it's going, going well or it doesn't make them look good. Everything that's happening, she puts it on him. He saved us. He did this. He made the decision to 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 save us, and we have to want to be saved. That is, for me, that's almost the it's just the peaking of narcissism right there, where she turns the whole thing around, and just dumps it on him. Classic. I think it's awesome. I think I mean it's not great, but I mean awesome as as in what a tactical move that was. I mean brilliant, really, from a narcissistic standpoint to make sure your ego stays intact. Great job <laughs> on the narcissistic <laughs> front. Wow. Okay, Chase, what do you got? I think there's more coming out here because if you watch the full interview, this question has some depth to it, and it had some what's called pretexting or priming to it a few minutes before this question came out. So I think there's an answer here that's got some latent uh, information here that's not just about what's, what's being said. Uh, Greg? Yeah, I, I think you're, you're dead on with that, with the priming, getting him to a position where he's more liable to talk. Here's an interesting thing. I, I heard both of you guys or many of you guys say earlier who, that Oprah isn't harsh or cruel. Really? That's one of the harshest and cruelest questions I've ever heard asked. You're sitting next to your very pregnant wife and ask her, don't you think she rescued you? Well, um, what do you think the answer should be? In this case, there really is no option to say no. In this case, he's he's in the road. He's got to do whatever he needs to do. Watch him go down to the left and think about it before he says no. Before he, he says yes, I'm, I'm like, really? I I'm smart enough to figure that one out. If I have a pregnant wife, I've just gone through all this stuff with, and I have to think about it. That's it's actually kind of amusing for me. The thing that bothers me a little bit about this that I think is a something I would watch in his body language moving forward. When he talks, once she says he saved us and he's saying whatever it is he says, there's no softness in his face. I think when people are saying, oh, you're right, yes, she did save me, there would be softness in your face. Now, I know he was a soldier, but I was a soldier for 20 years. I love my wife. If she said something, if I were really saying something I thought, you'd see softness in my face as much as I have. So there's some interesting little indicators in this body language, but Wow, Oprah, that's like a punch in the face with him sitting right there next to his wife. An interesting one to see. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so if you want to end uh, a piece of primetime TV, end with a grand narrative. And that's what, what happens here. Other forces at play. Uh, they evoke spirit. 
gods. Oh, first of all, there's the idea of un being unconsciously trapped. Therefore, you know, you, you can't, the gods aren't helping you. Your own mind isn't helping you, but the spirits and the gods come in. Also, there's the release of therapy as well. So unconsciously trapped, you have therapy. Suddenly there's a release. And yes, the spirits and the gods help you. The spirit here is probably something being hinted at there around Diana, the idea of her looking over him. British are going to love, love, love that I, that idea because she is the nearest thing to a goddess people have seen. The most famous woman in the world, potentially, named after a goddess, the, 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 the goddess of childbirth. So, you know, <laughs> good evocation there to happen. The idea, the word undeniable is used. It's undeniable. Well, you could deny it. You could deny it. But since you say it so strongly and it's at the end of the show, go on, let's go with it. Fantastic. And then, like, you, you might think it's over. You might think it's over. But here's what happens. Yes, she elevates him. Megan elevates him beyond therapy, beyond the spirits, beyond gods, and says... No, it's all him. So now she's elevated him into a, a super godlike situation. And there they are in paradise. <laughs> the hero's Sitting journey. With the hero's gods. Journey. Exactly. <laughs> the reluctant, <laughs> the reluctant, the reluctant hero. The reluctant hero. It's yeah, beautiful. Star Wars. It's yeah. it's wow. beautiful. So a uh, great end to a to a to a show there. Fantastic. Grand yeah, narrative job. Yep. All right. Well, that was the best of the Royals. And I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Uh, Mark, what, again, would you like to add anything to this? Well, yeah, I would like to add something. We'll undoubtedly be adding more Royals along the way. They are such an extraordinary group, such an extraordinary situation that behaviors go all over the shop, all over the place. So I can guarantee that we'll be back with more, you know, at some point uh, soon. Chase, what are your thoughts? If there's one positive thing to take away from this, is that most of us compare our regular lives to other people's highlight reels on Instagram and on TV. This shows you everyone's screwed up, and I mean everybody. So we tend to compare ourselves to the wrong thing. So go easy on yourself. Greg? Yeah, Mark, you said in the beginning, this is kind of like a car crash. This is kind of like a car crash where he keeps putting it in reverse and doing it again is what made this one really good. And this is a great example of what happens when you're cloistered and protected from normal and you get away with a lot of stuff until the bright light gets shined on the ugly baby. That's what I see. There you go. All right. Well, we hope you enjoyed that and we'll see you next time. Yeah, I don't know, I guess I don't know, I'm just gonna sell it.